Hi, welcome. Hey. It's so nice to see so many people gathered in the name of Crypto Queers. Um, my name is B Davies. As I mentioned before, I'm the founder of Crypto Queer, and this is our first event ever. So, thank you all for being here in this space and creating the vibe with us. Um, I've been in the crypto Web3 community for over a year now. Um, I have two companies. I have virtualfashion.io, which is a luxury fashion NFT marketplace launching in the fall, and Hive Global Media, which is a blockchain-based media and production company. And um, I'm having my event for that on Friday down the street at Mika from five to midnight. Um, so come through. And we'll be having a live fashion show, NFT drop, a premiere trailer for Hive Mind, which is a TV show I produced, wrote, and acted in, and so much more amazing stuff in the name of Pride and in the name of crypto. Um, and yeah. Uh, Crypto queer is, you know, a new thing that we're figuring out, just trying to create space for y'all, opportunities to learn more about um, what you can do in Web3. And um, I have this one to thank for our first event, Kelly Lucas, who can hey. introduce themselves. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, B, for inviting me into Crypto Queer. Some I'm really excited to, you know, be a part of a community of people that are queer and also want to be a part of the future of art and expression and activism. So that's why I found what you did really important. Um, thank you, everybody that's here. We're at the Bushwick Generator, home of Sun Arts and Sustainable United Neighborhoods. And uh, we're my business partner over here and I started two businesses, Kelly Lucas LLC and The Parallel, which is how... I float in space and can paint up there, which is fucking crazy. Oh, should I curse? Is that okay? You Sorry. can curse. Sorry, everybody. Um, so, hey, yeah. Also, thank you to Bubble Dow for sponsoring this event. Um, they, they're doing a lot of stuff to create um, inclusion in the community and also educate others. So they're the perfect sponsor. Um, I don't know if anyone from your team wants to like quick do a little, a little bit and tell us more about Bubble Dow. Yeah, 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 come up. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Lucy. I'm one of the co-founders of Bubble Dow. So we're all about bringing women and really just any minority community into the crypto space. Um, it's really, really important to us because um, my personal story is that even though I've been in the crypto community for a long, long time now, over, you know, over like five years now, um, a year ago, one of my friends was creating a DAO, a really good guy friend actually. And at the time, he was like, hey, I'm creating DAO. The buy-in's two ETH. And I was like, okay, cool. That's amazing. Like, let me buy in. I have two ETH. And this guy was like, hey, you're my really good friend, but no offense. I can't let you buy in. And I was like, what? Why? And he was like, well, I really only want crypto influencers in my DAO. So I was like, okay, out of curiosity, how many women do you have? He was like, oh, right now we have 80 people and three women. So I was like, wait, so a woman is coming to you with the money to buy in and you're not letting her, even though you only have three women. So because of that, I, you know, I can't blame anyone for a business decision, but I was like, I'm gonna do something to create change in this space. Um, so that's actually what led to what is now Bubble Dow. And it's all about helping women, helping minorities, helping those who aren't typically represented in the space, be in the space and feel comfortable in the space. I 
feel like everyone in this room might have, you know, a story, not necessarily just like that, but a story about, you know, if you're not a cis straight white male in crypto, you've experienced things a little bit differently. And, you know, that's part of why I wanted to create this based off of my experiences, um, you know, and a queer person in general, what we do, what we've always done is create community. So, of course, we should be in crypto, teaching them how communities should be. Because for me, crypto has always been a revolution. It's a way to create new general, general, ugh, excuse me, it's a way to create new generational wealth new power players, but we can't do that without educating our community and sharing the resources of others. So we really need allies. We cannot do this without our allies. So thank you for all the allies here tonight um, as well. Um, queerness is for everyone. It, you know, it goes beyond just gender and sexuality. It's really a way of life. <laughs> um, so yeah, but uh, enough about all of that, we, I'm on stage with some pretty amazing people who have their own stories to tell tonight. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, we have Tiffany Stewart. We have Christina Tibera. We have Kelly Lucas. And we've got Not Your Muse and Amanda Sidney. Um, yes. So starting with Tiffany, if you want to give everyone a little intro about yourself, what you do in this space, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, definitely. Hey everyone, my name is Tiffany. Um, I've worked in crypto for the past three and a half years. I'm the head of design at a blockchain called Stellar. Um, which has been established like, around since I want to say 2014. My main focus is on crypto wallets, um, you know, cross-border remittances, kind of all of the not sexy but very practical things that crypto and blockchain is capable of, and that's kind of what I focus on every day. Okay. <laughs> hey everyone, my name is Christina Tubera. I worked in traditional finance as a software engineer and sales and trader. Uh, so I've been in the space of finance and tech for about six years. And then I got into crypto because um, it marries both tech and finance. That's so been around for about three years. In my free time, I make TikTok videos and um, I have a finance page focused on women, minorities, and immigrants, just because I think that this is how we're creating generational wealth. This is the first time where you know, you're looking at probably a man in a suit or a kid wearing a hoodie and you don't know who's richer. So it's definitely fl flipping the script. Um, but I'm very happy to be here because I want to support more marginalized groups because this is how we create change. And actually, I'm going to quote B on this. When um, I interviewed her at the company that I work at, she said that once you start to uplift the most marginalized groups, that's when you see change. So you kind of start half at the bottom and then work your way up. So. Hi, I'm Muse. Um, I, my background is in fine art for the past 10 years, so I'm a painter, a gallery artist. I also curate art events, um, and now in the past three to four years, I've been just continuing to grow my art um, with creating metaverse spaces, um, virtual reality experiences, making, um, you can see some on the screens as they're playing, but uh, different healing environments and abstract environments, um, ways that you can like enter into my artwork. Um, also, uh, now I've just been building for other clients, like different metaverse spaces, and I think it's really exciting. Um, I'm excited to be here with everybody, and yeah. Hey everyone, um, my name is Amanda Sidney. I'm a fine artist um, as well as I work in TV and film production. I have a master's in um, television and I've taught at the university level in video production classes as well as um, media history classes. Um, in terms of my fine art, um, I do 35 millimeter photography, animation, illustration. I've been involved with the NFT space for about two years now, um, helping to launch certain NFT platforms um, as well as my own 
um, analog art as well, and I combine the two, um, especially with helping people create NFT projects from a commercial standpoint and focusing on utility. Uh, especially with the queer space, I think it's really important to talk about deconstructing traditional norms and expectations with regards to how the NFT space can impact our workforce. Um, and so I think that this panel is really important for that, as B was talking about, with how we can make what the workday looks like be something that is good for queer bodies and women, rather than opposed to straight white men in this space like post-COVID, where we really have the power to form community. All right. Well, going off that, another thing I wanted to talk about since this is called Crypto Queer is identity. Um, however you define it, um, queer being the most obvious um, on this panel, but in how that impacts your experience in the space and, and maybe um, is why you do what you do. Or, you know, feel free to tell any stories too. I want to create a a safe space for that because so often we'll experience whether it be um, a microaggression or, you know, is macroaggression a thing? That should be a thing. It's, I think it's a thing. Or a macroaggression. Um, and we're scared to say something because, you know, we feel like we hold such little power. But when we gather in communities like this, we realize, no, I've got people, I have a voice. So, also want to give you the opportunity to share those types of stories. But um, starting with Tiffany, how has identity impacted um, your experience in this space? Oh gosh, I feel like this is, this is a little tough. Um, I think that's quite different from my experience working in tech, which I've been working in for the past, like, I don't know, seven to eight years. My particular experience in crypto has been maybe the least misogynistic that I've had so far. Um, you know, perhaps it has to do with the fact that I work for a very, um, you know, altruistic, well-meaning company. Um, you know, I think a huge part of what we focus on is diversity um, and inclusion. But I guess what I would say in terms of ways in which my personal experience affects like my day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm a designer. My focus is working on products that are meant to directly impact people's lives. Um, like I mentioned, I work in wallets. Um, specifically, a wallet that we're working on is geared towards giving people um, in countries that experience incredibly high inflation, like for instance, Argentina, whose inflation is just through the roof compared to so many other countries, access to currencies that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. People in Argentina, for instance, will take dollar bills and hide them in their freezers or under their mattresses or all of these really, you know, kind of creative but particularly dangerous ways to store your money and give them an option that their country currently doesn't allow them to have. Like, I think previously, before 2020, um, people in Argentina could purchase about $10,000 worth of USD every year, and that dramatically went down to 200, sorry, not every year, every month, and that dramatically went down to $200 every month and people got super desperate. And one of the things that we are able to do is allow them to access um, stable currencies like USDC. And I know that there's been a lot of like, you know, negative PR around stable coins. I think there's a lot of distress going on in the market right now, but there are definitely those that you can trust and definitely those that you, you certainly can't. Um, so I think, you know, looking at these marginalized groups from the lens of somebody has been marginalized allows me to ask questions that perhaps not all of my colleagues might ask about this user experience, about what their, you know, <clears throat> particular day-to-day -day lives might be. You know, when we started this, we were a team in New York and San Francisco of like all white people. I think that I was like, I have a company about 100 people. I'm, there's three black people in the company, so that kind of gives you an idea of just how diverse we are, despite all of our great intentions. But, you know, there really wasn't that, that voice there. We were kind of 
I don't know, trying to save the day from an island without actually sitting down and thinking about who these users were. And I think that without the, I guess, perspective of somebody who is not the main person, somebody is considered, um, or that people are considered when designing a project or a product, um, you know, kind of gives me the ability to ask the deeper questions before just kind of making and going without, you know, really thinking about the person. Yeah, I guess that's my answer to that. Thank you. What was the question again? <laughs> Fair enough. How does identity impact your, your experience in this space? So I think identity for me came from my background. So I'm from the South. In Dallas, like a very small town in Dallas, Texas. My whole family's Catholic, Asian, military. Like any box that I could try to fit into, I was taught to fit into those boxes. So there wasn't a lot of freedom to be myself, to explore, to really think about like, is this something that I want? And I think that also perpetuated when I was in college. I went to a Southern college. I was in a sorority. Um, you know, a lot of slurs were thrown around um, because that was the norm. It wasn't until I got to New York that I saw a lot more diversity in how the world should look and be like. Um, but then again, I worked on Wall Street and unfortunately, you know, sometimes I tried to fit into those boxes. What I've felt in this space is a lot more inclusivity, a lot more questioning of like, okay, is this something that you want to do or something that you're taught to do? I think that once you start to question yourself and question your intentions, then you start to realize that there's other people around you who also question themselves too, rather than doing what they're told, like they were told to do. So that part of identity for me really grew when I entered the crypto space, because I think that, you know, this entire space is still new. We're bridging together tech, we're bridging together finance, we're bridging together art, all in one space. So in order to kind of succeed, we all have to think differently. So that's why I felt a lot more inclusivity here, rather than in kind of those traditional norms when I was back in Dallas, Texas. So that's kind of my background, and I'm just really thankful to be around other people who want to help me question myself, rather than say like, hey, Christina, like, what will your parents think? Like, I don't know, they don't pay my bills, so why should I care? But anyways, that's fine. <laughs> That was great. Thank you. So I went to Christina. I feel like I come from kind of a, a background that I just sort of felt like, okay, there's cookie cutter. I'm supposed to be a, a type of person that just sits back and like plays a specific role. And I mean, that's what, that's what made me have to be an artist just in general was to express myself when I felt like no one would, you know, care to hear what I had to say. Um, probably why I say hear me out so much, but, um, yeah, if you, <laughs> oh. yeah, no, subconsciously, that's definitely a thing. But, um, yeah, so from a background of misogyny and just kind of, you know, other people dictating who you should be, uh, I feel like as an artist and now as an artist that can, you know, use their physical artwork as um, as activism and push it even further with, you know, cryptocurrency and creating NFTs, creating NFTs that when they sell, they could fundraise for a charity of a cause that I believe in and that I definitely want to help out. Um, I, I just always found it so helpful and it's beautiful and it's empowering. So, yeah. Yeah, we've got some of your pieces up here. Yeah, we There's do. like a big one right, right here that I'm in. <laughs> yeah, um, does this, anybody know who this is in this portrait? Yeah, <laughs> I painted B um, and we were, we were discussing how manifestation is such a, it's such a strong concept and something that we both kind of discuss a lot and basically wanted to manifest it this piece in a very large warehouse like but nice like super cool viewing room with like a huge crowd of people manifested being in a museum and Justin and I got to talking and then a few days later all of a sudden now we have this 3D space in the metaverse like created super cool exactly what we uh, 
exactly what we discussed, but shinier. I was not expecting how shiny you would make it. So sick. I like it. You can see that piece on these screens, as well as the other art that Kelly and the other amazing artists here tonight who will introduce after the panel. Um, so check them out. Hi. Um, so... <laughs> As far as uh, identity, I find that um, the Web3 space has been kind of a level playing field. Like, um, one, because I think it gives you the freedom to like create your own environment, your own avatar, and like express yourself how you really like want to. Um, and it's a it's a whole the way that you can um, find a DAO or or a group or whoever that that matches your your niche of people, and you can find like your people this way is really cool to me. And I'm excited to be able to create like healing positive spaces that people can have events and and meet with people from all over the world, all different types. Whatever you're into, there's there's a group for you, and um, I think that's really cool. And and for me, I'm most excited about being able to, like, as an artist and a builder, um, being able to provide spaces that will be conducive to these, like, great long-lasting relationships and friendships that you, you meet online. You can even, like, come in with your avatars, turn your microphones on, and your, and your, even your camera, and, uh, and yeah, and meet someone from the other side of the world uh, who you never would have met before, and maybe then in real life, too. So I'm excited for the future of that. And you can also see Muse's art up here, behind us and on the screens. So identity actually is the central theme of the NFT collection I have up. Um, it's called Secret Selfies. It was sparked by the dichotomy between what our society considers fine art versus smut. I was thinking about originally that I'm a fine artist. I started with photography, um, doing 35 millimeter photography way back. A lot of people had me do human form stuff, nude women, but in a fine art context. And I started to think, well, what's the difference? If I um, took a photo of someone else with my 35 millimeter camera, then that's fine art. But then once you turn that on yourself and it's with an iPhone, then it's not. And then furthermore, when you're at a museum and if a man, a, one of the great masters, is painting a nude, then that's fine art. But if a woman paints that of herself, then it's not. And it makes you think, is that line between fine art and smut about viewership and ownership of who gets to determine if something is sexualized? Because if the artist is looking in as a voyeur, then the audience member is looking at it as such, and that's fine art. But then the second, the artist takes that empowerment and says, I know you see this as sexual, but this is fine art because I drew this, and this is just as good as that, and this is fine art because I'm telling you it is. Is that smut because of that empowerment? Um, I started, I did that concept originally because I, in my personal life, a lot of people I felt were telling me, oh, you don't have to work. You could just do OnlyFans empowerment to people who do that. Props to you. It's not my thing personally. I've spent a lot of time cultivating that part of my identity, of my, the standing by my work. And so for me, this was a commentary on perception of identity specifically. I think with the NFT space, it really causes us to be aware of perception versus intention because we all get to determine what our identities are and how we identify ourselves on social media, how we identify our NFTs, um, and how we're showcasing ourselves through that versus how people perceive us and how we're recreating those spaces and querying the expected concepts of who sees what and why and what is commercialized. Because ultimately, we as a community have the power to decide what does and does not matter. We as a collective society decided that crypto suddenly was going to be worth something, and so it is. Look at what happened with GameStop, for example, in terms of stocks. So if we have the power as a collective society to create a monetary system, then we have this power as a society to make it work for us and our community. And so being conscious, not just of what our intention is, but how other people perceive that in order to accurately get where we want to go, I think is something to be kind of aware of, even if you're directly commenting on it, but not to let that out of sight. Yeah. 
Yes, to all of these responses. Um, thank you all for, for sharing your perspective on that. Um, I wanted to quick open it up to the audience if y'all have any questions or um, wanted to share your view on how identity has impacted your experience in this space. Um, <laughs> here's a mic. In case, does anyone want to talk? Yeah, yeah. I didn't have a question and then it suddenly came to me. Uh, for those of you in the NFT market, uh, what do you say to people who refer to it as a democratization tool? However, the bar of entry is still egregiously high to disenfranchised communities. So I think a really, I think the most important um, part of the answer to that is something I was just thinking about, which is net neutrality um, and the importance of net neutrality. For anyone who doesn't know what net neutrality is, um, just as a brief overview, basically right now when you have an open internet, think about the way cable packages used to be with television that you would buy certain channels. Well, corporations would love if we could buy certain website packages in the same way, which means that disenfranchised communities and poor communities won't have access to the same information. And so the most important part of what you're talking about is making sure that net neutrality stays in place. It did go to the Supreme Court. John Oliver, a few many years ago, had a really great segment on it. If you just literally Google, not right now, John Oliver net neutrality, watch it, take the time, he explains all of it. Um, and I think, to go to your question, I think maintaining the ethos of that and uh, is really important because if we look at systems of entertainment and systems of communication and systems of media, they go from being open to being closed. The radio originally was started as an open tool for farmers to talk to each other about the weather. And that became closed over time with channels. Same with television, same with film. Look at what happened with OTT systems with Hulu. It started at there were so many, remember? And now there's just a few and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so while the crypto space is really big and open right now, that's just right now. There's go it's going to get smaller and it's going to get regulated and it's going to exclude people and it's going, that's going to happen. And so since we are still in this kind of like wild west stage of it in a way, now is when we have the opportunity to solidify how we are going to build community in this and how the systems of communication need to be something that works for us and not mimicking what has been. If that, I don't know if that speaks to that. Also, um, to add to that, I think that uh, it's important to keep doing events like this and educating people because um, as the space grows, it also, there are ways to mint for free. There are ways to, for like a dollar, you know, exchange things rather than, it, I, I guess like a misconception would be that everything's super expensive, but if you like had the, the teaching and the people to show you how to do these things for, you know, a fraction of cents um, on different blockchains. And, and I know, like, I think Ethereum might be switching over to, like, a, a more efficient blockchain, so it'll be cheaper. Um, so, yeah, it's going to continue to be more and more efficient and more blockchains that are more efficient are going to, you know, um, I guess solve or fix that problem. But it's, it's just a matter of knowing that that exists and then giving people access and teaching them how to do it and not make it feel like this, it's this like impossible thing. Um, but yeah, I think that's super important. Yeah, I agree with Muse with the educational um, aspect of it. We, we live in a society where like each school has their like criterion and what they're going to be teaching everybody and it's controlled and it's keeping people in certain places and I like you know that we can get together with people like Bubble Dow and give people you know free education on how to get creative and how to mint some NFTs and how to make some money for your fam and yeah I'm excited to see where that ends up going and how it empowers everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, just to add to what I was saying earlier, that's why we need allies in this space to provide these resources, this education, um, you know, as maybe disenfranchised folks ourselves in this space. We need the people with the coin to help us out and, and be a homie and, 
and spread. We, you know, I wish it was, um, anyone could just, you know, create a digital wallet and get some coin right off the bat, but that's, we know that's not how it actually works. So, um, yeah. I didn't know how to answer your question, so I'm just <laughs> Yeah, Emily, I don't know. I don't work in NFTs <laughs> like that. Yeah, and if you have, like, any... Yeah. What was your name? Emily Rose. Nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> no, thank you all. Did anyone else have, have any questions? Yeah. Hi, Jules. Um, does, maybe this is an annoying question to ask, but the current market, inflation, recession, impending doom, does that affect the artists that are dropping NFTs? Like, when you should do it, like, the minting prices, like, I'm interested in that, like, is there a right time, is there a wrong time? How do you go about, like, creating quantities and whatnot, and just speaking a little bit towards that? Um, I guess like kind of like the stock market or anything, like if you want to buy in, it's probably good to buy when it's low. So if you were interested in like getting into investing in crypto or NFTs, like now would be a good time because the gas fees are going to be lower. The yeah. prices will probably be lower overall. So um, it's, it's like a buyer's market, I would I, say. I guess specifically talking though towards the other end as an artist, like how your like thought process is, like when you're going to drop, like what do you think about, you know, there's one side of art and there's the other side. <laughs> For me personally, um, I, I view it a lot like a one-of-one one art piece. So I'll make an abstract piece and then find the client for it, and then we can work out a price. Then I'll list it, and you can buy it, um, rather than just having it up for sale. But um, I'm also maybe interested in doing like an auction of editions or something like that. Um, I like to have them pair with the physical piece too. Um, like, and if you buy one of my paintings, you get a gifted NFT. And that also serves, at least in the art market, as a certificate of authenticity later. So, you know, when I'm gone, if it goes to auction, you can prove that this is a real piece, um, which is an issue now. Like, if you're trying to sell or buy a Basquiat or something or a Warhol, you're going to need provenance and, and where all the places it was, which literally is what NFTs are. It's, it's tracking where it came from and all the places it's been. So it's perfect um, to pair it with art. Um, but as far as uh, when, I'm, when I drop, uh, yeah, I think I would like more so think of pairing it with when I'm doing an event or something like that, but not so much looking at like the price of whatever currency I'm using, Ethereum or, um, but, but yeah, that's how I kind of think of them. I love that you said that because um, the perspective that I've always come from is a total opposite side of that. So I feel like maybe you can find something in the middle ground that works for you. But um, I've approached NFTs from the form of utility. And so um, I have a strong community online with other NFT creators and promoters. And I find that the most important is having a solid discord. And so the right time to drop your NFT collection, um, if you're not pairing it with a painting. I mean, her paintings are legendary. So yeah, she can do that, you know, but like for people who aren't her and are releasing their NFT collection, I think building a solid discord and having that community because people want to see the long-term utility of it. So with mine, it's a trading card game. So there is a secret video in there. Is that fine art? Is it not? Is it you, you it, from my perspective, it is the same way when John Cameron Mitchell released Short Bus and it showcases real sex and that was fine art, or that was a film and that was his intention with it. But so that's, you have to find that one card. That's my utility of it. Other people have different utilities for their NFT projects. Um, but I think having a team that works towards building a solid discord that people can see that there's a lot of active engagement on that, um, that you can have a pre-sale a pre -sale that goes like through. This is if you're doing a collection of like five to 10,000 um, iterations of something like that. And when you really build up that community and you get them really hyped on it, um, then, you know, working with like the market, like she said, maybe find a time when it's like a little low and it's a good time to buy in. That could be a good time to like release a pre-sale and then you drop it once the, um, like the buzz gets really hot with that. But I would definitely work on creating that community because that will make or break a project if you're doing it, um, 
with regards to like larger collections or trading card games or things like that. Can I ask a follow up to your? Yeah. Um, so the, in a sense, like when the market is actually low, seems to be like the better time to drop it because it's um, more open, less exclusive because the, the, the market price is at a, a lower value. I find it that well, it depends. Honestly, I find it. I find that expediency is key. I was involved with helping set up this gallery that rug pulled, and that's really something to look out for. Um, so for those who don't know, a rug pull is when someone hypes up a new coin or a new marketplace, but based on it, like it's based on a new coin. So this marketplace was based on a new coin that they were creating. And they get people hyped up, they build an active Discord, an active Telegram, and then they, like, they the holder pulls out and everyone loses their money and they just ghost. And because this is the internet, you know, there's no regulations. You have to remember that a lot of the things that caused the Great Depression are being kind of replicated in the crypto space. So we have to like look a little bit with these rug pulls. You have to really do your research. And that's why people want to see that. So I found like with that gallery, when the prices got low, it was hard to get people to stay in the community because they became a little bit wary of it. They got unsure. They wanted to know like how long it was going to take. So I found with things like that, it was the kind of thing that when it went higher, people were more like, oh my God, I need to like buy this now so that I can trade it and then I can make money on it and keep growing. Um, so I think I found that with collections like that, that the better the market is, the more people, the more quick people are to buy into it. I feel like it's kind of like a bandwagon effect, though, because truthfully, if I'm an investor, I would want to buy low because then the um, like if it only cost you a thousand dollars, but then ETH goes back up to 4K. Now you just turned your thousand into four thousand without doing anything. So it's much better to buy low, in my opinion. But again, like. I guess like just psychologically people are like, oh, it's going up, it's getting hot now, I need to buy one because I need to like get on this train before it leaves type of thing. But like you kind of want to get on it before then. But yeah. Definitely, I agree with that. Um, I've experienced that when, um, when the prices go low um, on Ethereum, then everyone's using it at the same time to mint and then gas fees go up. So it's a good time to buy, but not the best time to mint, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. That answer your questions? Awesome. Does anyone else have a, a question or something they want to say? Yes. Justin, can you? Yeah, should we say, like, our favorite projects or artists right now? Tiffany, do you have any? No. <laughs> maybe maybe someone on this stage or in this room. Later, Tiffany will have an answer. I mean, I'm like, I, I work in crypto, um, but I like don't really touch NFTs. And I think even in my personal sense, I'm still fully working my head around finding the like deep utility within NFTs. So... I don't have a favorite project currently. Um, I like a small one. It's called Angel Alliance. Basically, you, um, I guess you buy an, an NFT and then you get to decide which women-led project we get to fund. And then we also reap the benefits. So it's like, instead of like having a VC, like we were pulling together our money, we're getting 10% back in exchange for like whatever equity. Um, I like that a lot because like it's more finance and like I understand it. But my other friends are really good at finding like cool trends. Like they get airdropped like five thousand dollars worth of something, then they trade it out. Like it's just really cool if you find the right projects. Unfortunately, I'm not that trendy. So um, I usually s stay away from the trendy projects, not necessarily intentionally, but I look at NFTs as a utility for artists first, rather than. An investment. So I love supporting my friend's art. Um, we have, oh my God, if your art is in this room, raise your hand. All right. Most of our artists are in the back there. Um, we'll introduce them after the panel. Um, and Kelly's art and my art as well. So those are all my favorite projects right now. <laughs> um, yeah. And 
more than that, like I love fashion NFTs. Um, that's where I started out in this space because I was doing virtual fashion production for my studio during the pandemic. And we're like, oh wow, this would be a great NFT. They're avatars in a digital runway. Um, and then recently got into film NFTs. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can do that. I like the subscription-based model. Um, I think that could be super revolutionary for streaming platforms. So yeah, as far as utility goes, there's there's lots of, of different things going on. Yeah, um, same with the friends. Like all my friends' art pieces and their projects on there are super amazing. I like growing and collaborating with all of them. That's how we even started the parallels. Just like, okay, you're an artist you want to get into this space, but you make physical artwork in this realm, like let's make you know the parallel universe version of that. So um, collaboration with other artists. Angel Alliance is really sick. Um, any sort of, any NFT project or crypto project that is, it's, it's there for the greater good, you know what I mean? I, there's so many, the sky's the limit on how it can help various communities and yeah. Um, I don't have a specific project per se, but I, I just like the idea of, uh, like B said, using like a, a membership idea, like when you own it. Um, I like that because it's like you can't lose your membership or get closed out after a while. Like it's a lifetime membership once you own it. Like um, also like to even like ticketed events and stuff like that, like you can rather than a ticket, if you own an NFT, you can come in. Um, I like those kind of ideas because it's like branching the art with, with the attendance and and then also like longevity like um you know your account's not gonna you don't have to pay every month like you have a lifetime membership now i think that's a cool concept um but yeah um so i don't have a particular nft project that i'm super crazy about right now but what i really love is actually what you do with the with the metaverse space and i think that what muse is doing is going to be the most important part of the nft space moving forward um and that specifically is what I think is the most exciting, um, as well as music and where music will go with that um, with regards to individual tracks being sold as NFTs and the way that um, visual artists can integrate with album art and animated music videos and things of that nature and turning that into um, the NFT space as well as the future of advertising agencies and how that will go with NFT and crypto specific um, web-based ad agencies for digital creative solutions. And so I'm really more interested in where it's going um, with that aspect of it from the media commercial space. If you want to also, like as music artists, visual artists, it, it kind of puts the power back in the artist's hands. Um, if you if you learn the space well enough, that you you can skip over the record label, um, and and yeah, it gives just a whole another avenue for people to sell not just their music but also their music videos because there's so much that goes into um, just every part of being an artist. You're just seeing like the tip of the iceberg as far as like you come to the event, but like you know they're working 24/7, whether that's like putting on the event, making the art or recording or whatever, people are working all day and night. And so to be able to monetize every different avenue of that and then also not having managers, record labels, people basically just taking your money and hard work. Um, and just and also now, not only that, the people who are your fan base buy into that and they're also gonna make money off of it too because as it grows in popularity and the price goes up, then they're gonna make money too. So it's like, what a better way to return the love to your fan base Right, so um, that's an exciting thing for for me, and then also um, building the spaces, the metaverse locations. It's not just art spaces, but like right now, for instance, I'm building uh, an accounting office for someone. Uh, I'm also like going to be building like a jewelry showroom for another company. So it's it's a bunch of different. Uh, ways that you can use this like uh, I was talking to even a realtor the other day about like basically building out units so that um, people who are abroad or whatever can can view a bunch of different properties at once and then fly out to actually see the ones that they like best like there's a million different ways that you can use it um, in the accounting office we're gonna have like 
a, a big rooftop with that you can DJ and have parties and stuff, and your avatars can all attend. You can either attend on your phone, on your computer, or if you have a VR headset, you can attend that way too. And it's a great way to meet new people. Um, I know Bubble Dow, they do like some dating events and stuff, so it's like a safe way to go on a date and not like be in the room with a new person, but like get to know them. Um, so yeah, it's it's so many exciting ways that you can use this. So. I'm excited to see what the future brings. I want to add that you touched upon um, how it kind of brings the power back to the artists that are usually, uh, their business is run by their management and stuff. If anybody in here is an artist with a gallery and your gallery wants to mint your NFTs for you, no, don't do it because you get stuck in a place where you're not in control of it. And I have, I personally have some pieces up that are frozen in time because the gallery never finished doing it and canceled an event. And they're literally up there and I have like no control over it. So look at this as taking your power back and take it seriously. Yes, take your power back. <laughs> All right, um, I wanna make sure we have time for the workshop that we're doing with Bubble Dow. It's an NFT 101 um, that we're doing after this upstairs. And um, we're going to talk how to create a digital wallet, buy some crypto, create an account on OpenSea, mint your art, we can do live minting. So if you brought your laptop, um, like you can mint, your stuff today. So we'll be doing that after. And then after that, we're gonna have a little Kiki, our DJ, Lola Menthol right here um, is amazing and it's gonna provide some music for you. Again, we have uh, drinks by Sono1420. Meow. Love you guys. And ramen, a ramen guy over there, what's up? It's literally like best ramen I've had in the US, so good. Um, and yeah, enjoy the artwork all throughout the night. Um, Kelly, do you wanna introduce the artist really quick and maybe y'all can stand up as Kelly says your name and wave. So you guys have just met, Muse is one of the artists with physical work in the room. Amanda has physical work in the room under the artist named Cherries. And then we have Lala here. Her work is over there. Makia's work is over here. And we have... Do you, just get up here real quick so we can see your faces. Lala, everyone. And MC. MC, the wavy, beautiful blonde hair. We also have some artwork by my friend Sarah, uh, Sarah Zach. She's in Berlin right now, but she wanted to make it over. Uh, she has some NFTs up, you can see it on the screens, and we have some physical prints out in the space as well. Yeah, so enjoy that, and let's all head upstairs for the workshop, and then we'll kiki. Thank you. <laughs>